It's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. fucking show you're gonna be like he did not he is not doing this of course i am because that's just how i fucking operate uh but anyway we are gonna start with the canadian mafia episode one so we are gonna begin our canadian series this week and one of the things i want to tell you out of the gate uh is that we're talking about a lot of different criminal groups here uh now while we have covered the five families very extensively uh, I don't know if this series specifically is going to be completely as in-depth uh, as it will be in, in terms of the five families. It's going to be in-depth as, as far as I can go. Uh, but I hope by the end that you have learned something. Uh, we're going to cover all the players and all the important ones anyway uh, and all of the families involved. What may shock you or surprise you is... And how many different groups there are. A lot of people consider the Rizzutos uh, the first family of organized crime in Canada. And the fact is, they really didn't take a hold of organized crime until the 1970s. And then shortly would end up going to war with the Catroni crime family. Uh, believe it or not, the Catronis and the Musitanos and the Papalias were really the first three mob families in Canadian history going back to the 1940s. Uh, so here's a list of who we're going to be discussing. We're going to be discussing the Rizzuto crime family, which was established in the 1970s, and they are a Sicilian-based crime family. Uh, their allies were the Bonanno crime family, the Contrera uh, Caruana, uh, the West End Gang, and the Musitano crime family. Their enemies were the Camiso Andrina, the Catroni crime family, and the Siderno group. Their base of operations was in Montreal. And obviously, we'll regurgitate this uh, throughout the next few weeks. Uh, the Musitano crime family was established in 1940s in Hamilton, Ontario, and they are an Andrangheta fa uh, faction. Their allies were the Rizzutos, the West End Gang, the Hells Angels, and the Contrera Caruana crime family. Their enemies were the Papalia crime family. The Catroni crime family was established in 1940, and they also were an Andrangheta faction, who allies were the Bonanno crime family. Their enemies were the Blast Gang, the Rizzuto crime family, and they would be based in Montreal, province of Quebec. Uh, the Papalia crime family, which is the crime family we're going to start with today, was established in the 1940s, and they're another Andrangheta faction, 
whose turf was based in Toronto and in the Hamilton, Ontario area. Their allies were Bobaro Andrina, the Agreste Andrina, the Maluso Andrina, the Buffalo crime family, and the Mirando Andrina. Uh, their enemies were the Musitano crime family. The Lapino crime family was another Andrangheta crime family based in Ontario established in the 1950s. Their, their only ally was the Buffalo crime family, and they had multiple enemies. The Contrera Caruana is a Sicilian mafia faction that is based in Montreal since the 1950s, and their allies were powerhouses such as the Corleonesi, which were based in Sicily, headed by Totorina and others, and they also had allies within the Rizzuto crime family. The Siderno group, uh, which was an Andrangheta faction based in Ontario since the 1950s, had a massive amount of allies. The Coluccio crime family, the Tavernese crime family, the Di Maria crime family, the Figliomeni crime family, the Russo crime family, the Camisso crime family, and they stretch from Calabria to Hamilton, uh, and they are a branch of the uh, Camiso, Andre, Andrina, and Calabria. Now, anytime I say Andrina, that is uh, the Italian surname or phrase for crime family uh, that is Andrangheta based. So in Canada, you have two major crime groups, okay? You have the Sicilians, which we know is Cosa Nostra, and you have Andrangheta. Uh, while these days, Andrangheta has really become the front runner of organized crime in the world, uh, but back in the early days of Canadian organized crime, the Andrangheta clans were operated much like Sicilian crime families. Uh, in some cases, Andrangheta clans backed Sicilian enemies. Uh, and it switched over a few decades after the Rizzutos basically eradicated the Catroni crime family. Uh, and there's, listen, there's going to be a lot of murder and mayhem in this series because Canada just doesn't fuck around. So... The first thing I really want to discuss, and we've discussed this a bit before, is the differences between Sicilian Cosa Nostra and Andrangheta. While we can traditionally understand how organized crime does work and sort of function, there are some differences. Uh, Andrangheta was first mentioned during the reign of the Bourbons of Naples. You can look that up for yourself. But during the spring of 1792 was the first official report of Andrangheta, much like how the mafia began. And if you're confused, go back to our earlier shows where we talk about it's on YouTube. I believe it's the etymology of the organized crime and how the mafia began in Sicily. Uh, it's very similar. It's very similar. Uh, Andrangheta spurred from overbearing barons in Calabria. Uh, it was the monopoly of lands that those uh, barons owned, which created a backlash from the youth in Calabria who would form groups, who would kidnap, murder, and control the narrative. Uh, very similar to what happened uh, in Sicily and, and Naples and other places like that. Uh, eventually, those groups would become the local police and the judi judicial system, uh, handing out justice in a way uh, that was bent to control the barons. Uh, ultimately, Andrangheta would also spur from the Camorra as well. In the 1880s, Andrangheta had formed, and much like the mafia in general, they had their own code of ethics and political control. Uh, we would come to know this as Omerta. Uh, the one difference is that Andrangheta used lineage perhaps more seriously than their counterparts, as a list of their rules and beliefs would be found in 1897 in a village in Seminara, which based its foundations on honor, secret, secrecy, violence, uh, and solidarity based on bloodlines and mutual assistance with other criminal groups. Uh, Andrangheta was a solitary group based mainly at the time in Calabria. It wasn't until 1975 that they began to move outside of Calabria. Their main source of income was extortion and blackmail, much like how the black hand uh, began back in the day. Uh, I don't want to really give you the, the complete history lesson on Andrangheta because it's going to be a little long winded, you know, but uh, as you can, uh, you can, you can kind of look that up for yourself, but you have to understand, albeit foundationally, how they operate. Uh, so what are the differences between Andrangheta and Cosa Nostra? Well, for starters, the lineage is completely different. Uh, when old Sicilians came to this country, uh, oftentimes they would choose men from their own village. Uh, and there was always a Sicilian versus other Italians sort of beef. It's been that way historically. It always will be. For instance, Vito Genovese uh, hated Frank Costello because Frank Costello was not Sicilian. 
there was a lot of that shit going on back in the day. And Luciano could never understand that because he says, we're criminals. <laughs> Who cares whether whether you're from fucking, uh, you know, uh, whether you're from fucking Castamolare del Golfo or, or whether the guy's from Calabria. What's the fucking difference? We're all Italians. But that's not the way that old school Sicilians saw it. Uh, if you look at Russell Buffalino, every single fucking Italian in Pittston today can trace their roots back to Montadoro, Sicily. Everybody Buffalino brought with him was from his fucking town. Uh, and so, you know, traditionally, you know, guys align themselves with the same people. Like the majority of organized crime bosses in America came from Castamare del Golfo. They all came from the same goddamn, you know, city and town. That's where they got their roots. That's where they got their beliefs from. And they took the beliefs from the mafia there and brought them to this country. Um, so, like I said earlier, every single member of Russell Buffalino's criminal group was from Montadoro. Uh, we've seen, you know, weddings between crime families to consolidate power. We saw Lucchese and Gambino do that. We saw Profaci and Bonanno do that. That's an old school value from Sicily and from Italy in general. But Andrangheta takes that to a whole nother fucking level as everybody within an Andrangheta family or a clan is related by blood, not by marriage, by blood. That means you're fucking related to somebody. Now, as far as the hierarchy, and this is kind of what I meant earlier when I said it can it can get a bit convoluted. Uh, so it's it's going to be a little tough because you might get a little confused. Uh, and I probably could have done this a better way, but uh, you know, Andrangheta's hierarchy is much larger than Cosa Nostra. We know in Cosa Nostra we got a boss, we got an underboss, we got a consigliere, we've got captains. And then we've got soldiers, then we've got associates. It's very basic. Now, why Andrangheta has a completely different system? Theirs is uh, vertical versus horizontal. Uh, and that's why it makes it different and, and looks in appearance. And you can actually go to Google and look that up for yourself to see it. But basically, Evangelo is a boss. Uh, your Cremine uh, is a leader. Your Capo Cremine is a leader. You have the Mastro di Giornata, which is a messenger. You have a Mastro Generale, which is like a colonel. You have a Capo Society. You have a Contabile, which is an accountant, which could almost be like a consigliere uh, at the same time. But underneath those group, you have what's called an Andrina, okay? And what the Andrina is, is the Andrina are clans made up of members of a family by blood, by blood. Each Andrina controls a territory, which is called a locale. Each locale has to have 49 members, which answers to the Capo Bastone. The Capo Bastone has a lot of responsibilities. Now, when we talk about captains here, a captain here has a crew, right? Well, each captain, cap, Capo Bastone over there is higher than what captains are here. I would look at a Capo Bastone, if I had to describe it to you, as an underboss, okay? That's not the rank but that is the power that they control. But Capo Bastones have almost even more power than an underboss would have here in the United States. Keep in mind, each Andrina, okay, has a Capo Bastone. They have to have 49 members in each one of these cells. So, we're, so whereas we can take uh, the 1980s Gambino crime family, let's say John Gotti's a captain, he probably has 20 guys in his crew. There's 10 captains, 20 guys, 200. Okay, so they're averaging 10, 12 a crew, whatever. 49 men per. So it's much bigger, okay? Uh, the Capo Bastone, like I said, has a lot of responsibilities. They direct all criminality in their area. They'll call meetings. They make decisions on who gets made, who gets promoted, and who's going to get killed. Just like the Capo Cremine in the central organization of Andrangheta, every captain... Every capo locale is flanked by a capo societa, and that is his chief manager. So look at it as a captain with even more. So I know it's very, very convoluted because it, it's hard to, because there's there's different types of captains that they have. Okay, you have a capo bastone. They're the ones that are controlling all their little turf in the area, like Brooklyn. You'd have a capo bastone who would control all of Brooklyn, but he calls the shots for Brooklyn, not the boss. He does. Okay, and he goes back to the boss and lets him know uh, how things are operating. A boss in Andrangheta has insulated himself so incredibly well. There's 10 leaders below him and another 
God knows how many underneath of that. It's a way for them to insulate themselves. That's why it's been so hard for Italian authorities to crack Andrangheta because they have they have like a maze of people, okay, like a pyramid. Anyway, so the Capo Bastone, like I said, controls basically everything in his fucking area, okay? But for every Capo in that particular situation, he's flanked by another captain, Captain Society, uh, who is his manager, okay? And he controls his orders. So this guy may call all the meetings. The Capo Bastone may call all the meetings, may give all the narratives, but he's giving that to another captain. So it's just a chain of command. That's all of this is. Then, like I said, then you have the Mastro di Giornata who delivers instructions to underlings. In slang, it means in Sicilian or in Italian to pass the news. So then, so like I said, you got the, the, the Capo Bastone. Underneath that, he's got a Capo Societa who hands out what to do, but he doesn't even really do it. He gives it to a messenger who takes it. So there's, if you look, it's just tiered in a certain way where nobody's connected really with anybody. You got to get through 20 fucking, 25 fucking people before you can get to anybody worth a fuck. It's very smart. Um, and like I said earlier, then, you, you know, we talked earlier about the contabile who just basically is a guy who takes all the money and makes it work. He takes all the money and he fundles it. He launders it. That is his job is to launder, uh, the, um, the, uh, the money. Uh, so, uh, so the locals, right. Uh, they have a double structure. I told you this would be a little confusing. I, I hope you guys aren't getting lost. Uh, rewind if you need to re rewind. Uh, but the local areas have a double structure. They have a societa minore, which is minor society, which comprises of the lowest level members. Okay. Then you have the society maggiore, which is a major society called societa santa which is the Holy Society, and it's composed of their superiors. So there's three minor league systems, okay? I know this is crazy, but think of it as the minor leagues of the mafia. They have the Society Minor, which is the lowest level guys who have no rank or associates or made guys, okay? Then you'll have the Society of Maggiore, which is the major society, um, and they're handling mid-level guys and then you have the society santa which is the holy society and that is what contains the leaders i, I know it sounds crazy uh there are many ranks and they're known as dotai uh and in the in andrangheta and the member's position determines what his job is what his responsibilities are and what he gets paid, to, what he gets paid. So the difference over here is everybody's got to go out and earn, right? Well, depending on whether you're in the holy society, the major society or the minor society is going to depend on what your job skill is, what you're asked to do, what your responsibilities are and how much you make. So obviously guys in the minor are making not a lot of money. Then you have the guys in the major are making all the money. Then you have the guys in the middle of the Holy Society. So there you go. Look at it that way, uh, which is a, a, an interesting thing when you consider over here. It doesn't even, it almost seems like it's just overbearing Andrangheta, but they do that for a reason. They do that because you have to earn your way. You have to earn your way up the fucking chain. Not just anybody can be a captain. Not just anybody can be this or that or the third. Uh, not just everybody can be a contabile. Uh, so it's a structure that's designed in a way to force you to earn it. And the lower on the totem pole you are, the less money you make. It's just uh, sort of the way that it works. Now, in the society minore, the lowest tier is occupied by the Giovanni di Onore, which is youth of honor. And that is a descendant of a boss and an honorary member by blood, meaning you were born into it and somebody down the line in your lineage, lineage was a boss. That gives you a title, okay? And that's the lowest tier. Above that uh, is the Picciotto di Honore, and that's the boy of honor, right? That's the first role given to those who join Andrangheta. So if you join, that's what you are. You're going to be a boy of honor, Um You'll carry out menial tasks, uh, uh, you know, until 
it's mostly manual labor, construction pro- projects and stuff like that, until you graduate to the position of camarista, which is somebody who collects extortion money. If you didn't know, you become a collector. Okay, a leg breaker. Uh, the top brass in the society, Minori, is known as sagarista, which is a soldier or soldato, if you want to say it in, in a different language. Well, same, I'm so all Italian, soldato. Uh, sagarista, same thing, soldier. Uh, one enters the upper house of the local, the society Maggiore, as a Santista. The name refers to his being part of the society Santa. A rung above that is the Vangelo, which is also, which is Italian for gospel. Uh, and it's so called because he swears loyalty to Andrangheta with one hand on the Bible. A tattooed cross marks his left shoulder. So one thing Andrangheta does that, um, one thing that Andrangheta does, which, which is different than, than other sort of organized crime is they identify with tattoos, which we could argue is, is both a good thing and a, a bad thing. Uh, but the, uh, the next is the twee, excuse me, the Trey Quarantino, which is three quarters who has privileged access to three quarters of the organization, which means he has a cross on his right shoulder and an emerald rose under his foot. The ranks continue upward. Cortino, one quarter, Padrino, Godfather, uh, Crociata, Crusader, Stella, Star, Bartolo, the origins of this title are unknown, the Mama Santissima, which is the Most Holy Mother, the Infinito, which is the Infinity, uh, the Society Maggiore culminates in the figure of the Conte Agadino, uh, and that name is probably a reference to Count Ugolino, whom Dante depicts as eating his own children in the Inferno. The boss of the Andrangheta may eat his children, sell them, sacrifice them without facing a vendetta. Arriving at the top of Andra- Andrangheta means acquiring the power to kill and betray one's own blood. Up to a certain point in the in Andrangheta's hierarchy, each rank has a religious reference and is identified with the saint. Uh, the Picciotto is associated with Saint Liberata, the Camarista with Saint Nunzia, and the Sagarista with Saint Elizabeth. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind that Andrangheta's initiation ritual is known as a baptism. Uh, the members position themselves in the shape of a horseshoe and receive the baptismal candidate from the guarantor, which is sort of like a godparent who vouches for the prospective member and authenticates his intentions to enter into the mafia clan. Uh, the Capo Society officiates the right, uh, asking the initiate questions and reading him the honor codes that he will be required to maintain at the cost of his life. The Mafia baptism is a blood baptism. Uh, the new member's finger, and this will sound familiar, is cut by a sharp knife so the drop of his blood falls on a prayer card and the image of St. Michael, the archangel, is considered the patron saint of Andrangheta, which is then slightly burned on the corner. At the end of that ceremony, a new man of honor is created. Every promotion to a higher rank requires a different ritual. So they have multiple rituals for different ranks, totally different than Sicilian Cosa Nostra. Uh, Their ethics are just absolutely insane. You cannot wear jeans. You can't wear a t-shirt. You cannot act like a playboy. You cannot disrespect your wife. You cannot lay a hand on your children. If you do any of those things, you will be banned or killed without hesitation. Uh, Without having to say it, Andrangheta is the biggest criminal group in the world. Uh, And with its structure in place, which I even admit is a pain in the ass to understand uh, and, and convoluted at best, they have become a worldwide powerhouse. Uh, the Sicilian Mafia took a, a more simplified approach to it, but the one thing that Indrangheta doesn't seem to have is rats. That's the one thing they don't seem to have. So I hope you know the difference between you know how this group functions. There's multiple bosses of Andrangheta. There's not just one at the top of the chain. There's dozens of bosses, okay? They're not under all one conglomerate, all right? Uh, and they control their territory and their turf, much like Brooklyn, the Bronx, Staten Island, Manhattan, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but it's a little different in Italy. So now that you know the difference and how the group functions, uh, because they're a little different than Cosa Nostra. Granted, I, I think that Cosa Nostra is a little easier to understand, uh, but they're different in approach. Uh, and you can imagine why in the beginning of the 1940s, when the mob first began its foray into Canada, 
why there would be wars. Well, organized crime is organized crime in many ways. How it functions, how the snake moves, is what prevents it from being killed. Whereas Cosa Nostra has, excuse me, a simple formula uh, to its structure. Andrangheta has walls and mazes of a hierarchy, which has been insanely difficult like I said earlier, for authorities to figure out. The first Canadian mob family that we are going to discuss today uh, are an Andrangheta family who arrived in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada in the 1940s. The Papilia crime family, uh, or what is also referred to as the Papilia Andrina. Uh, Antonio Papalia, who was born in 1894 in Plotti, Reggio Calabria, Italy, would have been great first to the United States landing in New York City in 1912. He would then immigrate to Montreal, then to New Brunswick, and then he would settle in Hamilton, Ontario by 1917. Uh, early on, Antonio formed an alliance with Rocco Perry. Now, Rocco Perry, uh, who was living in Hamilton, uh, also came from Plotti, Calabria, uh, and he was sort of the lucky Luciano of Ontario, Canada. You know, he arrives in Canada in 1908 after spending time in New York. By 1912, Perry would meet a lady by the name of Bessie Starkman, who was a Polish Jew who was married to Harry Tobin. Perry would start an illicit affair with her. Uh, the two were in love, and it wasn't until Perry joined the workforce on the Welland Canal that she would leave her husband and move in with Perry. Uh, so as World War I began to root its head, the Canadian government actually cut off funding to the Welland Canal, and Perry would end up... Uh, not having work, so he would become a baker, but it wasn't making much money, and then he would end up taking a second job with Superior Macaroni Company, but once again, there just wasn't enough money to go around. It wasn't until the Ontario Temperance Act of 1916, which was basically the Canadian version of the, the Volstead Act here, the Prohibition Act, but that really wouldn't be enacted and come into play until 1918. Uh and, you know, that's when Perry sort of moved and hedged his bets on being a criminal. Perry immediately begins to bootleg. Now, with Perry's contacts in New York, he moved full scale into the bootlegging empire that would that he would become known for. He would purchase secret distilleries and breweries, much like the people we talked about in the United States. Uh, but the, the, the money really became about moving liquor into the United States back and forth. That's where the real money was. Perry would then establish one of the most sophisticated exporting businesses. Uh, he was smart enough to get a medium-sized company to trust him enough to push liquor and alcohol like Seagram's and Goddardham, uh, excuse me, Goddardham and Warts into the American markets illegally. He also would align himself with Frank Costello and Al Capone, who through them was was able to supply Canadian whiskey to both Capone and to Costello. And it was through Perry that Al Capone had various hideouts in Ontario, even though Capone denied ever knowing Perry. The one thing that Perry had cornered the market on is the Canadian American wine. And obviously we see that still today. And he supplied both Canada and the United States, including New York, Detroit, and Chicago using Niagara Falls uh, and Windsor, Ontario for his base of operations. And that was because of the, the by proxy, how close he was to the United States line. Uh, Perry knew, uh, you know, nothing came without consequences. And what he ends up doing is uh, he ends up paying off not just the Ontario police, but word is that he had uh, large sums of cash delivered to border agents as well to ensure that trucks coming from New York and going to New York got back and forth without being inspected too much. Uh, bootlegging made Perry a multimillionaire, uh, and Antonio Papalia was pretty much next to him for the ride in some capacity off and on. Uh, Perry would then move into gambling, loan sharking, and prostitution, and while Perry was really the first big recognized boss, there was another crime family who was watching Perry very closely, and that was the uh, Scaroni crime family who had turf in the area, who also took their part of the bootlegging empire as well. But then they sort of begin to think of encroaching. You know, you see this guy making a lot of money, you want to get involved, you want to take it over. But on May 10th of 1922, Dominic... Uh, Scaroni was asked to attend a meeting in Niagara Falls. And the meeting, the, the the premise for the meeting was about the border and the movement of cigarettes and alcohol. Uh, Dominic, unfortunately, never makes it to that meeting as he's gunned down. Then on September 4th of that same year, 
uh, which is a couple months later, Dominic's brother Joe ends up getting picked up by Perry Associates, John Trott, and Antonio Di Conza. Uh, but he never arrives to a meeting he was supposed to go to. That death was ordered by Perry. Uh, and it was a necessary move for Perry at the time because what Perry really needed was allies to keep the Magadino crime family at bay. And the reason why is because Stefano Magadino had designs of taking over the Canadian market. Uh, and now you know why Joe Bonanno and Stefano Magadino, who were cousins, had a huge beef. That was the fucking beef over Canada. They both wanted to put their fucking you know, hands in a cookie jar there. But with the help of the Sarani crime family backing Perry, it was enough to keep the Magadinos at bay because the Scaronis weren't big enough. They weren't powerful enough he figured well even if they back me they're not strong enough to take on the magadinos they don't have the balls so let's just take them out absorb their fucking rackets whatever less left of it and let's align uh with the serrani crime family because that'll give us enough power base to keep magadino the fucking new york state that's basically what it what it was so by 1922, Perry used his illicit gain to begin moving narcotics. Uh, not only was he able to transport drugs over land uh, as well as booze, but he was also able to use boats, specifically in Lake Ontario. He had boats made that were fucking armored. Uh, which in the 1920s, that's fucking insane. He would end up hooking up with a guy by the name of Ben Kerr, who was also a bootlegger and also a rum runner. Kerr was operating essentially inside of Perry's turf and basically Perry allowed him to do it. Uh, uh, and, and he would end up using that to his advantage because he would use Kerr to smuggle raw alcohol into New York State, into Ontario, and he would take a kickback for it. So he's basically just saying, go ahead and do what you want, but you're going to be my guy that's going to go to the border. So that way he can keep his family out of the mischief and let Kerr take all the fucking risk. Uh, and he's going to take kickbacks on top of it. So with Perry's help, Kerr would begin to expand his operations. Perry was pulling in over a million dollars a year just from bootlegging. In 1922, and eventually he would have Kerr killed in what the Royal Canadian Mounted Police called a Marine accident. And it was no accident. Uh, Perry, Perry had realized that, that Kerr was expanding business like crazy, and he wants Kerr out of the way. He used him for as long as he needed him, and then he clipped him. Uh, Perry would further expand, uh, and alongside of him, as we said before, was Antonio Papalia. With Perry's operations growing even bigger, he began to get a little bit sloppy. In 1927, Perry would be called as a witness against Gotterham and Warts, who were in, uh, who were huge business partners of Perry, both in the bootlegging business, uh, but at the time they were under assault by the Canadian government for tax evasion. Under questioning, Perry admitted to buying distilled alcohol from them between 24, 1924 and 1927. It's a fucking rat move, but that's what he did. Uh, Gotterham and Wart were found guilty as a result of Perry's testimony and were fined almost half a million dollars. This is in 1927. That's a fuckload of money. Uh, Perry and his wife would be arraigned for their actions and accused of perjury, hiding their own complicity in bootlegging. So in other words, they said, well, we bought liquor from him. It was all him. That's basically what they did. As a result uh, of that case, Perry's wife uh, would breach a plea agreement uh, and just serve probation or whatever. But Perry ends up heading to prison for five months of a six month sentence for that perjury. Once he gets out, he continues his wealthy lifestyle. Uh, it would get caught in 1930 with illegal possession of illegal liquor. Uh, he would eventually be acquitted of those charges. Obviously he made a payoff and some bribes, but in August of 1930, Perry's wife mysteriously gets murdered over the years. There have been theories, but according to what I was told, and at least able to ascertain Perry had her killed for smuggling money away from the business into a hidden bank account. And that wasn't the only reason uh, Perry found out and basically has her killed as a result of that. Now it's long been assumed that Antonio Papalia is the one who killed her. Uh, there was also bad blood at the time between Papalia and uh, Perry uh, because uh, uh, Antonio's wife her family were the Italianos, and they were involved in organized crime as well, both in Italy and into Canada. And they worked for Perry because Perry at the time was really the only, the, the big mob group 
the, the big boss. There was a cousin by the name of uh, Naraze, uh, excuse me, Nazareno Italiano, and he ends up getting pinched in 1929 for trafficking heroin, which was a Perry operation. Rather than accept a plea deal, which he was offered, because if he accepts a plea deal, that would have meant that he would have had to admit that Perry would uh, would have been the guy who was the head of this. He doesn't say a fucking word doesn't say a fucking word. Italiano could have buried Perry at every turn and his wife, but he didn't utter a word. He ends up getting a huge prison sentence as a result of that. Now, it was assumed uh, by the Papalias and the Italianos that Perry would do the right thing and that him and his wife would take care of his family while he was doing a prison sentence. Perry refused, saying that it wasn't his fucking problem, which raised the eyebrows of everybody and it infuriated Antonio Papalia, because it's not what he believed in. So not only was Perry getting sloppy, but he was drawing a ton of heat. And he had insulted Antonio Papalia, who he apparently is underestimating. So Perry ends up, when Perry was doing his five-month bid, he had Antonio Papalia take over a lot of his rackets, and Papalia did a great job. He expanded. There were no problems. When Perry gets out, he resumes control of his businesses. In 1937, Perry opens a brewery in Toronto. In 1938, there are two attempts that are made to kill. Uh, there were two attempts on Perry's life. The first incident took place on March 20th of 38. His porch, basically outside of his house, exploded. Dynamite had been placed under the porch. He lived. He just didn't get killed by it. On November 23rd, a bomb exploded underneath of his car. He survived that attempt as well. In 1940, uh, Antonio Papalia gets sent to prison. And the reason why he's, he's sent to an internment camp at Petawawa, uh, and he was designated as an illegal alien and an enemy of the country of Canada because they alleged he had connections with Benito Mussolini, and a lot of it was just an anti-Italian sentiment going on in Canada. Uh, because he wasn't the only one. There were hundreds that went, but Perry also uh, would be arrested and sent to the internment camp. While at the camp, both Perry and Papalia discussed operations, and Papalia would be released from the camp in 1941. The agreement was made that Papalia would control all of the rackets and keep the business going. For two years, Antonio Papalia moved deeper and deeper into narcotics and began to take over gambling, extortion, and all of the protection rackets in Ontario. What Perry didn't know was not only was Papalia expanding at a quick pace, but Papalia was also making inroads to the American mafia at the same time through Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano, and Stefano Magadino. Uh, the amount of money that Papalia was turning back to New York was absolutely fucking staggering. Uh, Perry wasn't one to share in the wealth. He was a bit of an ego guy, a bit of a greedy fuck. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why Stefano Magadino was so hell-bent on pushing into Canada. He knew that there was money there. But now he's getting along with Papalia. So now you can kind of see where this is heading, right? October of 1943, Perry gets released from the internment camp. He ends up coming out and he sees all the good work that Antonio Papalia has done and what he's been up to. Not only had Papalia expanded his turf, but he also brought his son Johnny into the mix, who was used to collect debts, and this is when he was in his 20s. They also had expanded the ranks within the group. Perry had 100 or so employees that had been working for him in some capacity prior to going into the internment camp. Papalia had expanded that by over 100. So so Perry goes into to, to, to prison. Uh, he's got 100 guys on the street. And what Antonio does is he expands it to 200 guys, and now he's expanding into all other areas. Uh, why Perry couldn't see the writing on the wall at this point is beyond my understanding. But in any event, on April 23rd of 1944, Perry is heading to see his cousin Joe Serge. There had been issues between him and Papalia, but it was just business bullshit that, that, that he thought it was. It was not a big deal. That day, Perry disappeared and was never seen again. It wasn't until 1992 that authorities were able to ascertain what happened to Perry. Perry was kidnapped off the street by men sent by Stefano Magadino. He was beaten, fitted with cement shoes, and thrown over a fucking bridge into Burlington Bay. Uh, Italians have a word for that. It's called Lupara Bianca. So if you ever hear somebody, if somebody threatens you with Lupara Bianca, run immediately. <laughs> 
turns out Papalia had basically taken over the mafia in Ontario and had the backing of New York. Not only did he have the backing of, backing of Magadino, but he had it of Luciano and Costello too. Uh, Magadino had always wanted inroads of the Canadian booze and bootlegging, and he got it in the form through Papalia. Uh, almost as soon as Perry goes missing, Papalia takes over control of the Canadian Mafia and names Giacomo Lupino. And keep that name under your hat because you know the Lupino crime family is coming down the line at some point, but he named Giacomo Lupino his underboss and anyone under Perry transferred right into Papalia's control. So guys didn't stand around and just fucking wait and say, oh, well, this isn't right. You know, he's taken over. Perry disappeared. Guys just got right, got right in fucking line and didn't give any problems and just said, all right, we're just going to fall in line and just keep it going. Uh, Papalia then begins to answer to Stefano Magadino, Tony Silvestro, Colodro, uh, Bordonaro, and Santos Scabetta. So, you know, this idea that it, it's always been a weird thought process for me. Like we know with Rizzuto, right? He was in the, but he was a made guy in the Bonanno. He was a captain in the Bonanno crime family, but yet a boss of his own family in Canada. I never understood why anybody needed to fucking answer to anybody outside of their country. But this is the power that American Cosa Nostra had at the time. Also, you have to consider, too, Antonio Papalia knew he needed to make, not only could he control Canada, but now that he's got business interests with American Cosa Nostra, that means more money for him, more rackets for him in America, which is what he wanted, and that's sort of the reason why he's answering to Magadino, Silvestro, Colodro, uh, Bordonaro, and Santos Scabetta. That's why. Scabetta was a, uh, the Scabetta, Bordonaro, and Silvestro, excuse me, Silvestro were Canadian guys. Uh, Magadino was the American boss he dealt with. But uh, the alignment with the Buffalo crime family was complete. That completed their alignment. Uh, it was in 1943 that Papalia moves his base of operations from uh, Hamilton to Toronto. Uh, and it was just business as usual. Antonio brought his son, Johnny, right into the mix. So I know we kind of sped through this a little bit. Uh, but next week when we come back, because I didn't, I, I could have started going down, going down the road of, of Johnny Pops today. And I didn't want to do that because Johnny Pops, I mean, his kid, fucking genius from a very, very young age. Uh, you will see the people that he aligns because like a lot of other uh, organized crime guys and how they start, they, they, they join street gangs and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but who he aligns himself with are some pretty big fucking names. And through those names comes a massive narcotics operation. And we're talking about the 19, what, 40s? So, and you know how that's going to play with America and Luciano and everybody else. And we do know, historically, who does Joe Bonanno send to Canada to handle the drug operation for them? Carmine Galante doesn't Car doesn't Galante go over there and start a bunch of shit and try to take over everything till he gets thrown the fuck out of Canada. So there's so even even though there's this is a Canadian series, there is also going to be some rehashing uh, of Galante and some other people like that. So I didn't want to jump into Johnny Pops today because that's a story in and of itself. But uh, next week we're going to find out how Antonio Papalia steers the ship on a very smooth path. And it's going to be the rise of his son. Uh, and, and it's almost an identical situation uh, to that of Santo Traficante Sr. and Jr. Santo Traficante Sr. was very bright, very shrewd, very good at what he did. But his son was 10 times brighter. His son did shit that just blew my mind. So every once in a while, you'll see this in organized crime where a son takes over for his father and is better at it because he's learned from his father what to do and what not. Uh, so when we continue to talk about this series next week, obviously it'll be part two of the Papalia crime family. There's going to be, a, this is going to be a big series. There's going to be a lot of people we're going to talk about. Um, and, and unlike in America, you know how we, we kind of cut it off a little bit at a certain point. Uh, this will cut off around 2005, 2006. Uh, obviously, you know, if you guys are curious as to what's been going on with this crime family since just go over to mtrchronicles.com or listen to any of our Canadian shows that, that we've talked about before, uh, because can Canada is still a hot button, a hot button place. Uh, and it's like, I, I say it all the time. It's like a throwback. 
they do shit the old school way. So, uh, obviously, you guys know that, that we're going to talk about uh, the Rizzutos, the Catronis, the Sederno group. Uh, who else? The Lupinos. Uh, and the list just goes on and on and on. And we're not just going to talk about Vito Rizzuto. We're going to talk about guys you may have never heard about, guys that were integral to that crime family. Uh, the Volpes. We're going to talk about some Canadian, or uh, excuse me, some Italian guys that were working the, the action from Italy into Canada. There's a lot of different things we're going to talk about. And so what you have to look forward to coming back to listen is not only are we going to go through the whole history of this family, but they're going to have some problems with the Lupinos. They're going to have some problems with the, the Rizzutos. And we're going to go through each family and we're not going to chronicle every fucking guy that was ever in any crime, every, you know, every guy in, in every crime family. We just can't do it. But we're talking some major narcotics, a lot of fucking murder and mayhem because Canada has got their share of murder and mayhem. And I mean, as we've seen what 12, 14 guys been killed in the last six years over there, they're still doing it. So it's going to be a very interesting sort of experiment to look at how Canada does things versus the United States. And if there's anything that I could say that could sort of bridge that gap is Canada operates more like uh, the mafia in Italy than they do the United States. Okay. And, and that's why a lot of people ask me all the time, well, is entering going to be in the United States? They're already here, but they're not going to come over in droves because of the Rico laws. Uh, Rico laws just hammer you. You know, guys can get a, you know, over there, they got a gangsterism charge, right? That's like a five to seven year, 10 year charge. Gangsterism, just being a gangster is a problem. It's a, it's a, it's, it's against the law. But what they don't do over there is like murder. If you're a mob boss in order of murder here, you're probably going to get a life sentence or 30 or 40 years over there. It's like a five year charge so that, you know, they don't give a fuck The the crimes are just too stiff here for them. Uh, but do I think eventually you're going to see them here in droves? Yeah. The Camorra's here. A lot of people would never believe that, but they're here. They're here. Uh, you know, and so it's going to be an interesting contrast to see how the Sicilian factions deal with Andrangheta factions. Because like we said, sort of at the top of the descript description of this show, is that uh, you have seen, like we, we talked about, uh, an Andrangheta clan or an Andrangheta family being friendly with Sicilians. So there was a point where they got along. But by the time we get to the end of this series, you're going to understand why they stopped getting along and you're going to understand why Andrangheta has taken over everything. Uh, it's it's not just by happenstances by and by luck. I mean, the Rizzutos have been all but fucking dismantled by Andrangheta. But we also see Andrangheta move on each other too. And that's a big part of what I think is going on in Canada right now that a lot of people don't talk about. I, I we heard somebody the other day talking about, well, I don't know much about Canada, but you should, because that is the closest you're going to get to like throwback. And that's the closest you're going to get to how it functions in Europe. Uh, European gangsters are no fucking joke. Uh, the, 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 the European mafia, uh, be it the Albanians, be it the Balkans, uh, be it Andrangheta, be it even Camorra, uh, are, are nasty. They, they don't fuck around. They're a different breed. They take the shit probably more seriously than American gangsters do. Uh, and they don't hesitate. They take the rat shit very seriously. I, I can't tell you. I don't want to get into details, but I know somebody that may or may not be involved in something in Europe. Multiple people. Uh, it just how quick rats are killed and are left out in the open for the world to see does not take long. They're not afraid to do it there. Uh, so it, it just, it's very, very, very different. It would be like all the shit, you know, we kind of see coming out of Mexico with all the heads on the bridges. It's like that over there every day in Europe. Somebody's getting whacked. They don't like rats. They don't even want them coming to their country. Because I've talked to more than one guy that's a gangster in Europe who told me any of those American rats, they catch them anywhere, they're going to kill them. And they're not joking. It's not like a ha ha, you know what we'll do? Oh, no, they will. In fact, I could tell you a story. I could tell you a really big story. And I got to be careful how I say this. I'm not going to name who the informant was. But there may or may not be an informant I had a past with, okay? Uh, just did awful shit to my family, to me, whatever. Well, this informant decided it would be wise to go to Albania. Not a bright move. 
You know why? Because I have friends there. I have friends all over Europe. And friends don't like him. That First of all, they don't like rats. That's number one. Number two, they don't like anybody they know getting fucked with. So this particular informant thought he would play Johnny Bigwig and go hang out in some night spots. Guess what happened to him relatively quickly the minute he walked in because people found out where he was. He got dumped on his head repeatedly. And I don't mean like pushed, like shit beat out of him multiple times. Don't ever come back here, we'll kill you. That's how Europe deals with shit. I kind of wish the United States was like that. True story, whether you like it or not. So I just wanted to say before I get out of here for the week, uh, thanks for uh, humoring me. Uh, and thanks for allowing me to teach you history because that's that's what's important to me is that you learn something. Uh, and next week will be a better show. I'll be a little better, a little more healthy, and uh, we'll be back at it. But in the meantime, I wanted to say to my friend uh, Oli, thank you very much for your friendship. Uh, and do me a favor. Tell all my friends there in Europe I said hello and anything they need, they got. Uh, because that's how we roll.